All right, we're set. Well, good evening, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to seven scriptures you need to know by heart. Tonight is the easiest of the seven. I hope everybody's got the first one, but we are going to use the first one to study uh, salvation, obviously. So salvation is a big topic. Let me turn that down just a hair. How's that in the back? Is that still okay? All right. Um, yeah, when you, when you think about the doctrines of Scripture, other than who is God and, and his nature, his character, his plan for salvation is probably about as powerful of a doctrine that there is. And we need to understand this. And you think the church would have this locked down, uh, but unfortunately within the church, there are massive arguments, discussions going on. I was in a chat group this just this last couple of weeks with a guy that insisted that we need to be water baptized in order to be saved. And I tried to explain to him that water, physical water, doesn't do anything for salvation, as we're going to see, obviously, tonight. But we are going to walk through these very important doctrines of salvation. We're going to discuss a little bit, like we talked about last week, a little bit of the debate that has been raging for 500 years. And we need to kind of wrap our hands around that a little bit in order to fully tackle this doctrine. So we'll get into some of the election and predestination stuff as well. Uh, but in the end, we want to understand God's salvation. Uh, I spend an entire semester covering salvation, sanctification, and glorification, but really salvation, the three parts of salvation, salvation being past, sanctification being present, and glorification being future. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. So past, present, future. So we're going to try to squeeze a, like a whole semester or most of that semester into an hour and a half prepping this past week, I realized that's impossible. It can't be done. So we're gonna get out at 1030 tonight, if that's okay with everybody. Because there's chick coal for it. <laughs> because there's just so much here and you think it's simple and it is. And yet we could study it forever. And in fact, uh, I remember one, pastor talking about how we will be able to study scripture and all of the nuances of scripture for all of eternity. Doesn't that sound exciting? Yeah. I mean, we don't become omniscient when we get to heaven. I think we still have to work at it and study and, and, and learn and grow. And I think we'll be able to do that for all of eternity. So I think that's really cool. All right. Uh, admin stuff really quick from last week. Just there we go. Oh, now it's working. All right, just a reminder, we're on salvation lesson one here. Next week is lesson two, Galatians 2.20. And then we have an off week. We'll call it spring break. It's really Jeff and Julie's trip to Europe, but <laughs> we'll call it spring break. All right, so we're taking a river cruise. We're going to Amsterdam and seeing the tulips for some a friend of our 60th birthday and really looking forward to that. But we will be gone one week. Uh, so we'll take our spring break off and then we'll come back and we'll finish up the rest of the class. So let's pray and uh, and we'll get going. Lord, we're just going to pause and, and ask your presence, ask your leading, ask your teaching to guard our hearts and our minds and our words as we handle your word. We want to do it correctly, properly, that workmen want approved who correctly handles your word of truth, especially in this week, Lord, the Passion Week. Um, which was done so that uh, this way of salvation would be opened up by faith. And uh, you took the sins of the world, Lord. You were the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and that's what this week is all about. Uh, and thank goodness, Lord, that you did not stay in that grave. Death could not hold you. You say the grave could not contain you. You rose again just as you said. And we celebrate that and are thankful for that this week. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, just a quick note. So every year in my In Search of Truth class, which is a couple of you here, and, uh, and on radio, I do the final week of Christ's earthly ministry. And that final week is uh, a, a chronology of all the events from Palm Sunday through the resurrection, showing that the crucifixion had to happen on 
Thursday. So instead of Good Friday, we should all be celebrating Good Thursday. Thursday. And now I'm not the only one who has concluded this. There are many theologians that have come before me that have concluded the exact same thing. Um, so why don't we change? Why don't we all celebrate Good Thursday instead of Good Friday? I don't. Tradition is a powerful thing, isn't it? Uh, but we still celebrate Good Friday. But if you want to catch this whole teaching, I'll be on uh, Faith Radio Wednesday night at 5 p.m. Wednesday night at 5 p.m. And you can go to uh, KTIS 98.5 HD2 or 900 AM, or the easiest way, I think, is just MyFaithRadio.com, MyFaithRadio.com, and push the listen live. And uh, Bill Arnold says this is one of the most requested shows of the year, every year. And I, I recount how when I was in junior high, sitting in church, probably about this time of year, and the pastor said something about Jesus would spend three days and three nights, and just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man would spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and then rise again, right? And I remember sitting there as a junior high kid going, oh, let's see, Friday night, Saturday night. <laughs> hmm. Oh, well, what do I know? I'm just a kid. Right, the guy with the fancy robe knows a lot more than I do, so it must be true. Well, fast forward 20 years, I started studying it for myself, and lo and behold, I figured out you know what? It doesn't work, it really doesn't work. And Thursday meets all of the chronology, fits perfectly together in uh in the in all the events of the final week. So this chart that I walk through that I'll walk through on the radio basically outlines the key time references and, uh, you know, time descriptions in that final week from all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and paints the picture of the Thursday crucifixion instead of Friday. By the way, this is one of these kind of, kind of the, the holy goosebump moment in the talk is when Jesus was dying on the cross on Thursday afternoon, remember in the ninth hour, so late in the afternoon, mid-afternoon, that is the exact moment when all of Israel, for the Passover to be eaten that evening, would have been sacrificing their lambs, as Leviticus says, late in the afternoon. So at the same time that Israel is slaughtering their lambs for the Passover meal that night, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, is dying on the cross for our sins. Right? Coincidence? No way. No way. So it's, it's very, very cool. All right. Um, how did I get there? Okay. So last week, we did a couple things just to introduce the class. One, we talked about the promises to overcomers, and I went through all that, including the back of the book in Revelation 21, where it says, to him who overcomes, and who is an overcomer? Believers. Only he who believes, 1 John 5 says, that Jesus is the Son of God, right? So in Christ, you are all overcomers, and we will inherit all of this, the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, the new earth, and so on. We talked about being a good Berean and searching the scriptures, just as the Bereans were commended to do. Um, they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. I mentioned George Mueller, who I love the line in his autobiography, where he says, for the first few uh, whatever of my Christian walk, I pretty much preferred the words of uh, the 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 uninspired words of man to the oracles of God, I think is his exact quote. And we too should first desire the oracles of God. His word is living and active. Amen. We talked about the baptism baptism of the Holy Spirit. We did a little mini study, and we concluded that baptism of the Holy Spirit is simply receiving the Holy Spirit. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are, as Jesus said, baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that is what that phrase means. And yet there are many in the church that take that phrase and want to make some post-salvation event based on this description. But we clearly saw that it's receiving the Holy Spirit. And then finally, we went through a fundamental understanding 
that I do in just about every class. And that is an understanding of that we are a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. Our body is how we experience the physical world. Our soul is our mind, will, emotions, our memory, our decision-making. And our spirit is the part of man, unique to man, that allows him to be united with God, who is spirit. All right? So that's the part of man that died that day in the garden. So when God said, you will surely die, Adam did die that day, not physically, but spiritually. And when we believe in Christ as our Savior and we're made new, God says that spirit gives birth to spirit. And we move from death to life. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. And so that is the old self, this picture right here, body, soul, and dead spirit, that's crucified. We'll talk more about that next week. And we are raised in, as a new creation. So these are some of the passages that we'll look at next week. And then we also talked about the battle, which is not between two natures, because we have one new nature, but it's the spirit desiring what is contrary to the flesh, and the flesh what is contrary to the spirit. The battle is in our soul. That is where we make decisions. That's where we think. That's where we are to take every thought captive. That is where we are not to conform to the world. And that's, that's the heart of what we'll talk about next week with uh, Galatians 2.20. The flesh, the flesh. One of the things that I didn't get to last week because we ran out of time is what happens when a believer dies? Well, Paul tells us, right? He says we are absent from the body, but at home or present with the Lord. So our soul and spirit, that which makes you, you, is now departed from your body, which goes six feet under, but you are in heaven. We know we are in heaven because Paul says that it's better for him to depart and be with the Lord by far, right? Absent from the body and at home with the Lord. So we know that. I've been asked over the years, you know, where is my grandmother right now? And I say, well, was she a believer or not? You know, she died last year. And I, my first question is, well, did she believe or not? Oh, yeah, she was a strong believer. Well, we can know, Scripture says, that she is in heaven. And it's like, as Christians, shouldn't this be a pretty fundamental understanding that we have, that when we die, uh, we don't just stay in the grave, but we're going to be with Christ in heaven. It's a pretty big source of our hope that we have. Amen. And then finally, there is a day coming when we receive a new body, a new glorified body that will be like his glorified body. Um, and 1 Corinthians 15 talks about that body, all the resurrection appearances of Christ give us clues as to the nature of that body. But what's one of the things that Jesus did in his resurrected body that he couldn't do in his earthly body? He, he appeared in a locked room, didn't he? I mean, you know, I don't know the constraints that the material world places on a glorified body, but that's one of them that doesn't seem to be a constraint any longer. What else did he do? He ate. he ate. That's really good news. He what? Yeah, well, he walked on water in his before he was glorified. So that was still pretty special right then and there. He also rose up to heaven, didn't he? So the, the information that we have about our glorified body comes from 1 Corinthians 15 and the description of our glorified body and the appearances of Christ that we glean a picture. That remember, as soon as you get this glorified body, you now become immortal. That is your eternal, immortal body in which you will dwell forever and ever. Cool. So I got that going for me. That's a line from a movie. Um <laughs> You guys need to get out some more. Uh, I often reference a guy by the name of Clarence Larkin. He wrote a book about 100 years ago, and he has some amazing charts of all the books, not all the books, but many of the books of the Bible, including prophetic 
timelines of the end times and so on. Anyway, I, I love this guy to death. He, he died over 100 years ago now, but he actually has a chart of this body, soul, and spirit in his book. And I found this after I had drawn mine, and they're virtually identical, except he has a lot more kind of fun detail stuff, and it's kind of fancier. I mean, he draws little ears here. <laughs> I don't have little ears in my charts. Um, one of the things I, I don't know, what's this? I didn't quite understand imagination, conscience, memory, reason, and affections. And I don't understand why he has that going in between the body and the soul. But uh, anyway. All right. Lesson one. Turn to Luke 23. Like I said, there's lots of pictures or views or understanding of salvation within Christendom. But there is a story uh, in the Gospels that cuts through all these theologies and paints a very simple picture. And that is the story of the thief on the cross. Now, we know this story pretty well, starting in verse 39, that one of the criminals on one side says, if you're the Christ, save yourself. Did he believe? No. No. If you, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. He wasn't believing in Christ. He just wanted relief. He wanted to get down. But the other re criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you ate under the same, since we are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. I think he understood his punishment, didn't he? You know, that godly sorrow that leads to repentance kind of thing. I think when we understand that we're sinful before our holy God, that's kind of a prerequisite for understanding that you actually need salvation in the first place. And I think this thief recognized this. We are getting what our deeds deserved, verse 41. Then Jesus said, then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, that's all he said. Remember me. Now, the thief was never a church member, never went to confirmation class. He never was baptized. He never gave money to the poor, probably. He was a thief. He was probably greedy. He was a criminal. I, don't, I doubt he has very many good works. He didn't have probably too many awards or, you know, like man of the year award from the Romans. And all he says is, remember me. I just saw a, 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 a neat video by a pastor by the name of Alistair Begg, and he was recounting the story of the thief on the cross. And he says, I wonder what's going to happen the day that, that this thief goes to heaven. And the angel's going to be there, and he's going to say, well, okay, well, you know, why, why are you here? And the thief's going to say, well, I don't know. He goes, well, well what do you mean you don't know? Well, you, you want to get into heaven? Why are you qualified to get in? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, wait, wait a minute here. Let me, let me get my supervisor for a minute. And he gets a supervisor, and the supervisor comes over. And he says, okay, you know, we just got a question for you here. You know, why, why, are, why do you think you should be allowed into heaven? And he says, well, I don't know. He goes, well, do you understand the doctrine of salvation by faith alone and the doctrine of justification or imputed righteousness? No, I don't know what any of those things are. So why, why, why should we let you in? I don't, I don't understand. And he says, the man on the middle cross said I could come. And that's the qualification. The man on the middle cross said he could come. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He was entrusting in Christ, even though they were both about to die, that what Jesus had said about himself was true, that Jesus was going to bring this kingdom someday. And this man was saying, 
will you bring me into that future kingdom? I'm going to entrust my eternal destiny to you, even though we're both about to die. And so Jesus said what? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. And the man was saved. Think about all of the theologies that this just cuts through. The story of the thief who had simple faith of trusting who that man on the middle cross was. So he said, remember me. And Jesus says, you are saved pretty simple picture, isn't it? Well, we actually have more simple pictures. The woman at the well, turn to John 4. This is a beautiful scene. How many of you watched The Chosen? Oh, most of you. So I've kind of given up on The Chosen. Should I give my editorial comments at this? No, I'm not going to. They just, they just veer away from the Bible so much. I mean, it's, it's no longer biblical stories. It's, it's historical fiction. It really is. I mean, season one at least had some scenes like Nicodemus and the woman at the well in the last episode. Season two, I don't think had one biblical story. One story from the words here. I don't think one of the plot lines was in scripture. It was just all what's called historical fiction, historical characters, but fictitious stories. And my, my counterpart on Guy Talk, he's a pastor, he says, yeah, I've got people quoting the chosen to me. <laughs> That's the risk, right? That we get in our heads pictures of Christ or what happened that aren't in the Bible. If I was to do a show, and it's well done, don't get me wrong, season Three started with, you know, five, ten minutes of the uh, Beatitudes. And it was wonderful because it was biblical. But then the rest of the show had nothing to do with the Bible. Right? I see you guys all nodding your heads. Yes, yes, I agree. Well, and the rest of the season. So I, I really, really wanted to like it, but I've I'm kind of given up on it. Sorry. I hate to burst your bubble if you're a big fan of it. Um. Where was I? Oh, but they did the woman at the well, and the woman at the well scene was powerful because it's in the Bible, I would argue. So Jesus is with the Samaritan woman, and he says, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for living water, and it would well up to eternal life. Now, in The Chosen, she runs back to her town because Jesus told her everything about herself. Not everything, but just a few things. But he said, I'm going to tell everybody about you. He told me everything about my life. And she runs off back into the town. And Jesus, in The Chosen, says, I was kind of counting on that. Now, that's not in the Bible, right? <laughs> but it, it's kind of fun. It's kind of cute, right? Okay, I could, I could, that's, that's kind of artistic license. Fine. Let that kind of stuff slide. But when you make a whole narratives that aren't, anyway, enough. She asks, if you drink, if you would ask me for this drink, you would have eternal life. You'd be saved. Pretty simple picture, isn't it? Moses, if you look at this bronze serpent, you would live if you got bitten by the snake. So Moses lifted up and you'd have to look at the bronze snake. By the way, what does this remind you of? Medical. medical. It's the medical symbol that we use today. You would be healed. In the same way, John 3.14 says this, quote, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life. If you look, you will live. If you believe, you will have eternal life. Very simple picture. And Revelation chapter three, turn there. This is one of the in one of the seven letters to the seven churches. This is the to the church of Laodicea, the last church. And Jesus says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. 
Now, some will say, well, that's not a salvation verse because Jesus is talking to the church at Laodicea. However, to that same church, he says, you are, I thought I had it on my slide, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Does Jesus ever describe a believer in Christ as wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked? No. In fact, the descriptions of those who are in Christ Jesus are exactly the opposite of each of those. We're rich, we're clothed, we are victorious. So they are not saved. And he says, knock, I'm sorry, he knocks, open the door, and I will come in and eat with them and they with me, a picture of salvation. This is a perfect picture of biblical faith. If you believe, if you open the door, he will come in and save you. A very simple picture. That's why Luis Palau, who preached the gospel to more people than probably any other person ever to walk the face of the earth, who was a wonderful man, by the way, and died a couple of years ago of lung cancer, he would close every one of his crusades with that passage, I stand at the door and knock. And if you open that door, you will be saved. Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Enter the gate and you will be saved. A picture of faith and salvation. A very simple picture. He also said, wide and wide is the road that leads to destruction, narrow the path that leads to eternal life. So choose or enter through the narrow gate, because small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. If you enter the gate, you will be saved. Are you seeing a pattern here? There's a pattern of very, uh, a, a picture that's very simple. By the way, it's often taught, I know you guys to the left can't see this down at the bottom here. It says, by the way, if you are saved, you are on the narrow road. How many of you have ever heard it preached that, that you need to stay on the narrow road? Because you can fall off the narrow road, and if you fall off the narrow road, then suddenly you're going to find yourself on the broad path that leads to destruction, right? So stay on the narrow road. Have you guys heard something to that effect? Once you believe and are saved, once you believe and are saved, you've entered the narrow gate. You are on the narrow road that leads to eternal life. Is there any getting off that road? Not if you believe in assurance of salvation, which we'll get to tonight. If you're secure in your salvation, is there any getting off the narrow path? No, that's salvation. That represents salvation. You as a believer in Christ Jesus are on the narrow path. So salvation is conditional. We just saw it. Remember me and you'll be saved. Drink and have eternal life. Look, up at the serpent, and you will live, believe you'll have eternal life, open the door, and you will eat with Jesus, enter the gate, and you will be saved. This sounds an awful lot like our verse today, John 3.16. That is conditional. It's a conditional statement for God so loved the world that, oh, no, 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 this was our memory verse. Right. Who wants to re- I'm going to do this every week. <laughs> I wrote, I think I wrote my email, I was going to call on people. <laughs> no, I'm going to ask for volunteers. Who wants to recite John 3.16? Hmm? Anybody that wants, just start it then. That's beautiful. That sounded really nice up here, by the way. Thank you. Yes. So here we have a very simple conditional statement. If you believe, you will have eternal life. Now, I do all these because you're going to see this simple condition 
has been debated in the church for hundreds of years. So that's why we're doing this. Believe and be saved. We see this condition very clearly in Romans 10, verse 14. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Do you see the progression? Now, I think I told you last week, I'm an ex-consultant, and we generally analyzed processes and documented them using flowcharts. So we're going to do a little flowcharting tonight. Kind of feels like work all of a sudden, right? Flowcharting is very simple. You've got processes, you have decision points, and you have inputs and outputs. There's a lot of other symbols, but those are the core basic symbols. So what did we just hear? Someone needs to preach. What do they need to preach? The gospel. And that gospel needs to be heard by somebody. You have an unbeliever who needs to hear. He needs to consider the truth of the gospel. We're going to get to the gospel at the end. Remember, there's a line, and I'm just going to say it here. Uh, Francis of Assisi supposedly famously said, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Hmm? It's, it's one of these things that the gospel is words. The gospel is a truth claim. It's a concept that Christ died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. Do you believe that? So you have to use words to preach the gospel. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, should we also do it out of love and do good deeds and be a good witness and all those kind of things that the statement is really alluding to? Well, yes, absolutely we should. When a person hears, here's the decision point. This is the diamond. You either believe or you don't. For those who believe, yes, you're saved. Now, salvation, we'll, look, we'll talk about tonight all of the things that happen at the moment of salvation. You can see a few of them here. Forgiven, born again, eternal life. You're made a child of God. You receive the Holy Spirit. You're reconciled with God and so on. And that salvation comes as a free gift, grace, from God. But if the answer is no, if the person does not believe, if they choose not to believe, what is their fate? They perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. They'll be saved. So that is the simple flow chart. Now, I have a little more detail on, everybody got the handout that I passed out? You have an extra one? There's some in the back, too, if you, if you need one. So this document, for those on Zoom, I emailed this out to everybody this afternoon, so you should have it in your email. But it's basically the same thing with a few more oh, details. Uh, the purple is the, in, the start and finish of the chain. So if you're going to move somebody from an, oh, I have it on here. If you're going to move an unbeliever who's separated from God, and you're going to move them to being one with God, they need to hear the gospel. Because someone needs to preach it to them. And the preacher needs to be sent by God. Did he send us, by the way? Yes. He did. I mean, go into all the world. He has sent us. So if you're a believer in Christ, you have been sent. You don't need to wait until you hear a voice from God, by the way. You've already been given your orders. You have orders. You've been sent. So we've all been sent to preach the gospel. And if you hear it, yes, then you're saved by his grace. And you move from death over there to life over here. From death, unbeliever, to life. Here's that list again. We'll get to that tonight. Because it's a full, comprehensive, and very powerful list. And if you don't, you perish. 
just like a consultant to flow chart it, right? I don't think it makes it any less wondrous and miraculous. Um, I think it's kind of cool, but maybe that's just me and how I think, you know? Huh? Clarity. Clarity? Good. Act 16. Turn to Act 16. One more picture, then we get to the chart. Um, do it. Can you start passing these out? So this is kind of like the uh, you know the freshman flow chart. Julie's now hand on, handing out the first of our seven charts here that we'll get to in a minute. It's like the grad school chart now. Okay, so this is the simple one. This will be the grad school one. But let's go to Act 16 really quick. We know the scene in Act 16. In Philippi, Paul and Silas are arrested. They supposedly caused some trouble because of a slave girl. And they are put in prison. They're actually beaten and put into prison, even though he was a Roman citizen and they shouldn't have done it. And while they're in prison, they were singing and worshiping God. And the jailer must have heard them. The jailer must have heard them because of what happens next. There is an earthquake. And this earthquake comes and all the doors open up and all their shackles open up. Now, I don't know why shackles would open up because there's an earthquake, but that's what happened. God sent an earthquake and it opened up and they're all free. And what, what does the jailer do? Do you remember? He, he, yeah, he rushes in thinking that all the prisoners had escaped. He's about to kill himself because that's the penalty for losing your prisoners. He would probably have been put to death. So he was going to save them time and kill himself. And Paul says, no, wait, we're still here. Amazed, he asks the most important question that any person can ask in life. What must I do to be saved? And like the thief on the cross, the answer to this question is going to cut through all of the different theologies that compete for this picture of God's salvation. Because do you know the answer? The answer is, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. There's a singular criteria for salvation. And that is believe. Now, this word believe in the Greek, if you know one Greek word, by the way, you should know more than one Greek word because anymore, the Greek words are available to you at a click of a button or a touch of your finger on your iPhone. Uh, one of my favorite tools is called Blue Letter Bible. There's an app called Blue Letter Bible. Download it and you can click on any verse see the Greek words, and see how what the definitions of them are. When I first started studying, you had to take a Bible, you had to look it up in a, a Greek word numbered Bible, look at the number, go to the dictionary, look up the dictionary use of that word, and then find out what the Greek word is. Now you just click on the verse and you can see every Greek word right there. Okay, there's also a web page, blb.org. It is a wonderful tool. And sometimes we glean a little more depth of understanding when we look to the Greek. Because sometimes, sometimes, now our English Bibles are reliable, don't get me wrong, but sometimes we gain a little bit more understanding when we have a fuller understanding of the Greek behind the English, or the Hebrew for that matter in the Old Testament. If you know one Greek word, know this word, pistuyo. The Greek word pustuyo, it is translated mostly believe, sometimes trust. This word has two primary definitions in the Greek. To believe it's true 
and to entrust for salvation. So the fullness of pistuyo is to believe it's true and to entrust for salvation. To believe it's true, you need to believe something is true, and then you need to entrust for that salvation. Now, when I first discovered this Greek word, somebody asked me a question in a class, well, what about the demons? You believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. And they say, well, demons believe in Jesus, don't they? So salvation must be more than simple belief. Oh, good question. All right, let's check it out. I was convinced when I went to the Greek for James here in James chapter 2 that it was going to be a different Greek word. But you know which word it is? It is pistuyo. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Pistuyo. It's the same Greek word. It's the same Greek word that we are required to do for salvation that the demons do. And then I remembered this two-part definition. Wait a minute. Do demons believe it's true that there is one God? They do. We know who you are, son of the most high God. Do they know? They absolutely know. But demons, uh, same word, believe it's true. They do not entrust for salvation. In fact, salvation is not even offered to demons. They can't believe to be saved. God came as a man to bring salvation to men, not to demons. So do they believe it's true? Yes, they do. Same Greek word. This takes nothing away from the single criteria of believe and be saved. But remember, the fullness of that word believe is to believe it's true and to entrust for salvation. Question online. Yeah. It says Acts 1631. It mentions you and your household. Can yeah. you comment on this? Yeah, so in Acts 16, it says uh, the answer to the question is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. Um, that was the question that came from online, because when we believe everybody in our household is saved, right? <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. No, if you go on to the rest, towards the end of the chapter, it says that once the J were believed, they went to his house and his whole household believed. So I think that's what is it's referencing. They ended up actually going to his household. His whole household heard the story of the gospel, and they all believed. Clearly, I can't believe and save the rest of my family, right? So Now, in the Greek, here's a little interesting, little more Greek. That's why you need to know this word deeply. You know, one Greek word. There's what's called a voice in Greek. So there's a, a tense and a mood and a voice. Well, the voice is either active or passive. I should have, forget that. What voice, were you guys already looking at the slide? Yeah. <laughs> what voice is belief, active or passive? Active. We believe. It's in the active voice. It represents the subject as the doer or the performer of the action. Believing is our responsibility. That's what we have to do. We have to believe. It's in the Greek active voice. The doer is who do does the action. What do you suppose, what voice is saved? Is the Greek word sozo. So I'm not going to click my button this time. Take a guess. Active or passive? Ooh, a little less sure here. Active or passive? Show of hands. Who says passive? Who says active? Who's doing the saving? God. Who is he doing it to? Us. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Who saves us? God. It's in the passive voice. We do the believing, 
God does the saving. The passive voice represents the subject is the recipient of the action. Believe is in the active. Sozos is in the passive. Isn't that a perfect picture? Do you remember your flow chart? Who is the one who saves? God is the one who saves. Can you save yourself? Can you forgive yourself? Can you give yourself eternal life? Can you redeem yourself? Can you make yourself a child of God? Can you seal yourself with the Holy Spirit? No, you can't do any of that. That's all God's work. He saves. He saves whosoever believes. Cool. Active, passive. Isn't that neat? Believe and be saved. By the way, we looked at several pictures, but this pattern, this, this, this flow chart shows up all over Scripture. John 1, believe in his name and he will make you a child of God. Believe in him and you will have eternal life. John 3, 16, believe and have eternal life. <coughs> John 6, 74, he who believes has everlasting life. John 11, he who believes will live even though he dies. Acts 13, everyone who believes is justified. Another word for saying saved. Romans 10, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Ephesians 1, having believed, you received the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5, everyone believes is born of God. Genesis 15, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. If you believe, you will be saved. That's God's plan of salvation. It, it, it really is that simple. By the way, belief is the same as faith. <coughs> Give me that water. I just got a tickle. Um, belief and faith are the same words. One's the verb, one's the noun, pistuio, pistis. It's just the verb and the noun, but they mean the same thing. To believe it's true and to entrust for salvation. So when it says that the, we are justified by faith, it's just it's the same as saying we are justified by believing. Same, same. So whether you see the word faith or believe or actually trust, they all mean the same thing. So when Jesus says trust in God, trust also in me, you could translate that in the English, believe in God. Believe also in me. This sounds like we have free will to believe or not, doesn't it? No, <laughs> no it can't be, he says. This is, this is something that, once again, this, is, this debate, I, I, I have to tell you guys, I, th this debate just, it really seems kind of silly to me because over and over in Scripture, we see that we have free will. And we know by our own experiences that we have free will. Did you decide to come to this class tonight? What did you decide to have for lunch today? You, you don't have to answer that, I guess. <laughs> I had chick fil -A. I could eat there seven times a day. What's that song? Who sings that song? Chick-fil-A. Hawkins, yeah, Hawkins, he sings that song. Joshua says, choose this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Sounds like a choice, doesn't it? Elijah condemned the prophets of Baal. How long will you waver between the two? If God is God, worship him or follow him. If Baal is God, by the way, it's pronounced Baal. Did you know that? I just learned that a couple months ago. Follow him. You have a choice. That's called free will. Jesus in the garden as a man said, not my will, but your will be done. The problem is not 
that we don't have a will. The problem is that we have a will and we use it. That's the problem. So over and over, Scripture is full of this choice. Oh, Israel, how I've longed to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. Pretty well. All right. One other argument before we get to the chart is if we, if we have to put faith in Christ, doesn't that make faith a work? No. Have you heard that before? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank, thankfully, God actually specifically addresses this uh, kind of attack or question on simple faith. And that is in this line right here. Came in a little early. No, here it, here it comes. However, to the one who does not work but believes or trusts, depending on your translation, God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. What word is that? Oh, there I did it again. I showed it. What word is that? Pastuyo. However, to the one who does not work but believes, God specifically tells us that belief, faith, is not a work. So if someone ever says to you, well, if it was up to you and it was by your faith, well, then you had something to do with your salvation. And you can quote to them Romans 4 and 5 and say, no, faith is not a work. It's a belief not a work. Chart. First of seven. I know there's a lot here. There's a lot here. <laughs> because there's a lot here. Yeah. Say again. Is that all you're going to say about election? Uh, no. Oh. No, it will come up a, again a little bit more. So this is kind of the flow chart, the simple flow chart with lots of passages. So let me tell you how this came about. So I was trying to, to understand salvation and looking at the many different verses and subtopics of salvation, and I started grouping them together. Oh. And I started grouping them together. Like, how does God describe an unbeliever? Here are some of the descriptions of an unbeliever. What's God's desire? What's his call on the lost? What's God's solution to the problem? And 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 how is that articulated in the gospel? That people, here's that decision point right in the middle, right? There's that diamond again. That's the heart of this salvation, conditional salvation. If you believe, you'll be saved. Here's salvation. This is God's work by his grace. If you don't, I call this the many, the many's response that they will perish. God's judgment, God's assurance, God's promise. And now we are Christians. This is the, a, a list of descriptions in Scripture that describe who we are as believers. And that's that box. So these are, these are kind of subtopics, if you will, of salvation. And I got done. If you can imagine, this was, this was months of work. Right, of just kind of thinking about these issues and reading passages and seeing how they fit in and then listing them and then rearranging them and reorganizing and putting some lines in and so on and so forth, right? It would take the rest of us years. So. <laughs> so, so it's just, it's just, this is all just scripture, by the way, right, with some lines. So I finished, or I thought I had finished, and I'm looking it over. I thought, oh man, this, this is pretty good. 
And I started looking, it's like, oh, wait a minute. John 3.16 is not on the chart. <laughs> how, how could I miss John 3.16? There's no way that I could miss John 3.16. That's like the heart of salvation passages, right? And I looked and said, like, oh, I'm going to have to put it on the chart. No, it's not there. I looked all over. It's definitely not there. So I started, oh, does, where does it go? Does it belong over there? Or, no, here? No, it doesn't really, no, it's not really down here. Does it belong over here? No, where does it belong? And I suddenly realized this whole chart was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Cool. So I wrote it in bold across the whole sheet. And, and, and this chart was then the first, and then I decided, oh, I'm going to do this to Galatians 2.20, <laughs> right? So I did it to Galatians 2.20. That's next week. And then we're off a week. Don't forget. I'll keep reminding you. <laughs> and then we'll come back and do the rest of it. All right. So how do we walk through this? Well, I'm going to change. The last half hour, I got a half hour left. I'm going to change how I walk through this. I'm going to... Because I did a presentation at, at, uh, at I do this at Teen Challenge, and it's a simplified version of this. Follow along on the chart because the verses are there. It's just a little differently presented, okay? Is everybody good with that? Here we go. And I start when I do this, talk about a guy by the name of George Wilson. Now, some of you who've been in my classes have probably heard this story before. But it's a very powerful story of salvation. Back in 1829, this guy by the name of George Wilson and his friend robbed a truck, a U.S. mail carrier truck. And in the process, one of the government workers was killed. They were both arrested, charged with capital murder, found guilty, and sentenced to hang for their crime. But George Wilson knew somebody who knew President Andrew Jackson. And in 1830, Jackson issued a pardon for Wilson. He pardoned him of the crime. But Wilson rejected the pardon. This had never happened before. What do you do with a guy who's been pardoned by the president but rejects the pardon? And nobody knew, unsure of how to proceed, the government went to the court system and the capes went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. The chief justice at the time was Justice John Marshall. And he wrote the majority opinion, which said this, a pardon is an act of grace do you think this guy knew biblical salvation, by the way? It's a gift, an act of grace, proceeding from the power entrusted with the execution of the laws. That's the president of the United States for the United States of America. Who is that on a, on a universal scale? God. Which exempts the individual on whom it's bestowed from the punishment that the law inflicts for the crime he has committed. A sinner has broke the laws of God and deserves punishment, doesn't he? But a pardon takes that punishment away. A pardon is a deed, he continued, to the validity of which delivery is essential and delivery is not completed without acceptance. It may then be rejected by the person to whom it is tendered. And if it be rejected, we have discovered no power in a court to force it upon him. You know what happened to George Wilson? He was hung. Why? Because why? He didn't accept the pardon. Mankind broke God's law. We are guilty before God. So Jesus sent 
God sent Jesus as the Savior of all men to pay for the sins of all people. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When Jesus said it is finished, that's what he meant. The price had been paid. God has pardoned the world of sin. That's what happened on the cross. Everyone has been pardoned. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The world has been pardoned. But what's the key? Obviously, they need to accept it, don't they? In order for it to be effectual. So that's man's problem. Scripture says that in Adam, we, are, we have all died. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are separated from God. These are some of the descriptions of the unbeliever. We are dead in our sins. We're ignorant, lost, in darkness, unbelievers, blind. God's wrath is on them. That's man's problem. We've broken God's laws and we're dead. We're under condemnation. But thank God he doesn't leave us there. So his desire, look above the box, is that he wishes none to perish, but he wants all men to be saved. And all means all. He's not willing that any be lost. He takes no pleasure in the death of anyone. That is God's heart. He wishes all to be saved. So he sent his son to die for all. That's his heart. His solution is this week. But God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took away the sins of the world. He gave himself as a ransom for all. He's the savior of all men. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, in the King James, we'll use the propitiation, the idea that God's wrath, the penalty for the sins, has been turned away when we accept God's pardon. But make no mistake, he's pardoned all. So God's call. See the call box right above the lost there? You know, this is interesting because part of the, you ask, are we going to get to the election? This box is really at the heart of that debate. Does God call some or does he call all? Well, I think there's many ways that scripture points to the fact that when Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw some men to myself all men to myself. So how does he do that? And if we scan scripture, we see that he actually does this in many ways. In Ecclesiastes, it says he put eternity in man's heart. Do you know that man is, is, has an understanding that when they die, they know that's not the end. So we big, build giant pyramids and put treasures in them for the afterlife, right? They may not understand it correctly or properly, I just leaned into the camera here. That's probably going to look really bad. <laughs> they may not understand it properly, but they have a sense that there's something after this life. Romans 1 says that God makes himself known in creation. When you look out the window and see nature, even lost people go, ah. Oh, you know what they're responding to? They're actually responding to God, and they don't know it. If I showed you a painting, you might ask, who painted it? Sculpture? Who sculpted it? Creation? Who created it? Right? All creation declares God's glory. Romans 2 says he puts the righteous requirements of his law on people's hearts. People have a morality. We know right from wrong. Where did that come from? God says it came from him. C.S. Lewis has a wonderful argument about this, that he says, you know, why does God allow evil? And 
and and he goes since god uh, allows evil he must not be all powerful or he must not be uh, must not be all loving and therefore he allows evil into this world and c.s lewis responds well the fact that you're calling something evil proves that there is a god who has put in your heart what is evil the very idea that you are calling something evil means that there is something that is good and there is therefore a standard by which you are measuring what is good versus evil. That is exactly what God says he's placed in your heart. Really good argument, isn't it? The law is written on their hearts. He sends his spirit to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And the gospel is to be preached to the whole world. So we are supposed to be partnering him in this effort to tell the world that he is there, we're supposed to go into all the world. <clears throat> I stand at the door and knock. Scripture declares that he knocks on the heart of every person. When I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. The gospel, we're going to have a whole week on this, but the, week, the gospel is very simple, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to many. That is the gospel. That's the truth claim that God asks us to believe. Now, some will say, well, the thief on the cross didn't believe the gospel. Was there a gospel yet? No, there wasn't a gospel yet. He believed what God had revealed to him up to that point, and that is, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You're the Messiah. You're going to usher in a kingdom, and I believe that. And he was saved. God, in fact, commands us to believe. That's the top box in the middle. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Repent. Believe in his son, Jesus Christ. Believe and have eternal life. Believe me that I am in my Father. Turn to me, all the ends of the earth. God's screaming this from heaven. If you're listening, he's screaming this. Just believe in me. I'm here. I've been asked over the years, why doesn't God make himself known? more known to the world. I said he came to earth. And the whole world, most of the world, has heard about this very obscure Jewish man that lived over 2,000 years ago. He's made it known. But we have to hear it. They have to hear the gospel. That's why we preach it. Faith comes by hearing. And so on. Look, there's tons of verses here. So the desired result, as we've been talking about, is to believe. Whoever believes has eternal life. There's some of the verses that we looked at earlier. Because when we believed, then we are saved. And then it's God's work. I think this is one of my favorite boxes on this chart. God's work of salvation. The moment you believe and are saved, God forgives you. That's one of the things that he does. You are given new life. You move from death to life. You're born again, born of God. You are made a new creation. You receive eternal life because you didn't have eternal life before you believed. Now you have eternal life. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit, sealed with the Holy Spirit. You are justified. Think of justification. Justification means you are brought in alignment with, right? Left justified text, right justified text. Your righteousness has been brought into alignment with Christ's righteousness. Remember when Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect? The one criteria for entrance into heaven is perfection. Is anybody there? Is anybody there? Then none of us are going to heaven? 
Huh? In Christ's eyes, we are. Yes, he has made us righteous. He has made us perfect in Christ. So hold that thought. We'll talk about that more next week as well. We're rescued, redeemed, made a child of God. To him who receives Christ, we are made, given the right to be called children, children of God. One of the great lies of the world is that, oh, all, we are all God's children, right? Is that true? No, we're given the right to be called children of God through faith. You must be born again. And it's by his grace, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Someone should write a song about that or something. <laughs> so grace, you can see it up there. It's by grace. It's a free gift. And then assurance. So this, this topic, uh, let me just read a couple of the verses here. Nothing can now separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 says, Having believed, you are marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Man, it, it, it can't be any more clear than that. As soon as you receive the Holy Spirit, God says it's a deposit, and your inheritance, your future inheritance, is now guaranteed by the presence of the Spirit within you. And by the way, that Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So we can know that we know that we know. So 1 John ends his chapter 5. 1 John 5 says, I write these things to those who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know that you know that you know. You're saved forever. Your salvation is kept in heaven for you. I mean, there's just dozens of passages. And then God's promise, the last thing on here... We have an eternal life. We have a future resurrection, a future glorification. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. These are all the promises to those who overcome. Remember all the seven promises that we looked at last week? Not be hurt by the second death. We'll reign and rule and reign with him. And we will be with the Lord forever. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. That's the rapture verse, by the way. The end of the rapture verse. We will be with the Lord forever. That's our future. Amen. God's promised it. It's going to happen. That's his promises. That's your inheritance. And then you see over, not up there, over on the far right-hand side, look at all of the things that God calls us now that we are in Christ Jesus. I'm just going to point out one. Over on the left-hand side, you see the word sinner, Luke 5.32. See the word sinner? Over on the left, under the unbelievers? Unbelievers are described as sinners. Do you know that believers in Christ are never described as sinners, but they are described as? Saints. saints. Thank you. To the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Colossae, to the saints in Philippi. We were sinners, now we're saints. So that phrase that you always hear, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I, 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 I get why people use that, but actually it's not biblical. Just change it a little bit and say, I was a sinner saved by grace. Now God sees me as a saint. What does that word mean? It's hagios in the Greek. Holy. Are you holy? God has made you holy. You are a saint. That's what he's done. The idea that our identity in Christ is now holy and blameless in his sight is at odds with our own personal understanding that we're not living it out, right? Do not take away from what God has declared, that he has declared you holy and blameless. This, by the way, is the, the theological concept of imputed righteousness, that God takes his righteousness and he gives it to you, and you're not holy and blameless in his sight. Do we live out our holiness perfectly in this world? No. 
So we recognize that and say, oh, I'm not a saint. And the answer is yes. You've been declared a saint. You've been declared holy and righteous because you are in Christ and he was holy and righteous. Not because of what you have done. Now that we've been made holy, we've been made a saint, are we to live that out now? Yes, we are to live out our calling. So there's the, the dynamic that we've been made holy, but none of us live it out perfectly. At least I've never met anybody yet that does. A couple people that thought they did. <laughs> then you go talk to their spouses. And you're like, <laughs> and of course, the no part of this the many's response. Yet they refused to come to me to have life. They heard the gospel, but did not combine it with faith. If you do not believe you will die in your sins, he will punish those who do not obey the gospel. They perish. Why do people go to hell? Yeah. Whenever, I mean, I, uh, people have asked this, and if you get into a conversation with somebody about God, they'll eventually ask the question, well, why does a loving God send people to hell? And the answer is he actually doesn't send anybody to hell. Free will, right? They perish because they refuse to love the truth and thus be saved. God has pardoned them. God has done everything because he loves the world and he loves everybody in the world. And he sent his son to die on the cross to take their sins away so that he could pardon everybody of their sins. But the pardon has to be received. People perish because they refuse the pardon. They perish 2 Thessalonians 2.10, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and thus be saved. <coughs> so whose fault is it? It's man's fault, right? It's man's fault. And when you think about this, it couldn't be any other way. Because when we get to that new heaven and new earth, he says that he's going to make all things new. Heaven and earth are going to come together. This new Jerusalem, the streets of gold, the pearly gates, the tree of life, the river of life, the throne of God, heaven and earth come together for all of eternity. And we're going to dwell there. And he says he makes all things new. And he says nothing unrighteous will ever enter into it. If you're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, you have to be righteous. If you don't have Christ's righteousness, you're not allowed in. You can't be allowed in. That's the way it is. So they'll be put out. Revelation says, if anybody's name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, he is thrown into the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the second death. Has to be that way. God didn't want that. He wished none should perish. He sent his son so that everyone could believe and be saved. That's not his heart. Is God's heart going to break that day? When most of the world perishes, in the lake of fire, is God's heart going to break? Are, are our hearts going to break? Are you going to know some people when they're standing before that great white throne and their names are not found in the Lamb's Book of Life and they're thrown into the lake of fire? Are you going to know some of those people? Is your heart going to break? God says, some say that there's no crying in heaven. And yet we actually have a passage where it says, God wipes away every tear from our eye. Do you know that passage comes right after 
most of mankind is thrown into the lake of fire. And on that day, I think God's heart is going to break. I think our hearts are going to break. And it's in that moment that God says he comforts us. He wipes every tear from our eyes. And then there's the new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. And nothing unrighteous will ever enter into it. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then after that, I don't think we ever cry again. Mostly because macadamia nut cookies grow on trees and we can, we can eat them anytime we want and not get fat and just... That's in the Bible. You don't believe me. Hmm? <laughs> he said that was on an episode of The Chosen. <laughs> Good one. Oh, do we? We don't have time to do election and stuff now, huh? No, do it. Yeah. Does he take your memories away? You know, you're in heaven. Does he take the memories away of those who perish? Yeah. Does he take your memories away? I, I don't think God does. If we're if we're crying, we're sad. Uh, I think because we recognize some people that are being thrown into the lake of fire. Um, there is nothing in Scripture that says he wipes our memories away. If he wiped our memories away, by the way, we wouldn't even remember that we were once lost and that we were saved because of what Christ has done and and now have salvation. Um, so, no. In, in fact, some will say, for example, marriage. That Jesus says there will be no giving in marriage. I think that is because there's going to be no procreation. Because if we could procreate in the new heaven and new earth in our glorified bodies, what would happen? We'd make kids, and they would have to decide whether to believe or not. And we'd have the same old problem all over again. And we'd have to start over. So I think the idea that we're not going to procreate is the idea that we're not going to have children. My I, I believe I will know that my wife was my wife on earth for all of eternity. I believe I will know my parents were my parents for all of eternity. My brother was my brother for all of eternity. We only have a couple of stories in scripture where this comes up. Uh, for example, Samuel was called up from the dead and, he rec and Saul recognized him. Lazarus and the rich man, they recognized each other and recognized Abraham. Um, so I, I no, I don't think that, remember, eternal life is a continuation of this life. And so I don't think we... The memories of your lost, you know. Yeah, just of the lost. No, I, I think because we cry and he comforts us, I think in glory, we will understand that it couldn't be any other way and it will be for his glory. Yeah. Is it biblical that a person has a hardened heart and therefore doesn't believe? Yeah, so the question is about hardened hearts. In scripture, every time God talks about hardening or giving them over to a strong delusion or even hardening Pharaoh's heart, it's it's in their unbelief, all right? So it, it, the picture is generally, okay, in your unbelief, I'm going to give you over to the world. If that's your choice, then I'm going to give you over to it. By the way, Har Pharaoh's, hardened, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. That was hard to say. Um, not about salvation but about setting Israel free. That was what his heart was hardened about. It had nothing to do with salvation. That's, by the way, most of these issues on election and stuff, uh, hardening, uh, all those issues. And I, I've got like 15 more slides that we were going to do, but we just don't have the time. But generally, without free will, um, you, you have to make the assumption that you have free will and that people either choose to be saved or choose not to be saved. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and thus be saved. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm deciding what to say here because if I, as soon as we open this can of worms up, it's going to be a 20 minute discussion, right? So, um, but yes, hardening is in unbelief, basically, in scripture. I, I, for example, let me, let me just do this one chart. 
because I've just got a couple minutes and see if this kind of answers. Jesus says, when I'm lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. So this, this whole idea, if you, if you, if you recognize, or if you understand kind of this debate in Christianity about does God elect some to salvation or does he offer salvation to all? That's really the heart of, of this issue that's been going on for 500 years, right? Um, and, and there's lots of ancillary issues surrounding it that uh, I'll, you'll have to come to the salvation class because I cover all of these in that. And it takes a long time to get through them all. But it's basically the picture. Now, all the verses that we just looked at, I want you to, to draw on all that information in this chart and the flow chart and decide this. Because one picture says that God draws all men to himself and some believe and are saved. And, and clearly that's the picture that we presented here today. Alternatively, the, the, the elect camp or those who believe in election believes that God only draws some in the world and that those are the ones that are saved. Okay, so what about this guy? Does he, have an, does he have any opportunity to be saved? No, he doesn't. If he's not elected, he has no opportunity to be saved. And generally speaking, the this, this story, uh, I won't go there. Yeah, I mean, this, this is at the heart. So when Jesus, when I, when I went through the, some of the verses on how God is drawing all men to, myself, to himself, wants none to perish, but all to come to repentance, he genuinely means it. And when he says to all men everywhere to believe, to repent, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a bona fide offer of salvation to whosoever. This camp over here doesn't, that doesn't fit this camp because God picked some and only they become believers. Only they are saved. And so if you're outside of it, you're kind of, you don't have any opportunity to be saved. So that's the heart of it. Um, what, so let me ask you a question. So I've got about a dozen more slides. Would you guys like to delve into this more at the beginning of next week? Or do you want to jump straight into the next question, because what we discuss, discuss here tonight is what must I do to be saved, right? Next week is kind of the, the question, how now shall I live? Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. This life I now live by faith, and that's what we're going to discuss. Would you like to take 15 minutes and talk more about this or just yeah. Kick it off to the side and leave it dangling out the window someplace. Do you want to? Who wants to talk about this for a little bit next week? You don't care either way. And that was a lot of hands. Okay, we'll we'll do this because really the core that we we've got to look at two men here, right? John Calvin. Who's this guy? Anybody know? Jacobus Arminius. Do you guys know these two guys? We've actually been battling their ideas for 500 years. We were at a funeral in Wisconsin a few years back. And we're in rural Wisconsin. There's this beautiful old church built 100 years ago, more. Wall brick, steeple, and everything. A quarter mile away, there was a new kind of mid-century modern, rather ugly building, actually. <laughs> and it was a church. But the church had both of them. Now, there's nothing else on this road for miles except these two churches. And there's two churches within a quarter mile of each other, and they're owned by the same church. So I asked the, our friend that we were, were there for her father's funeral, I said, what's, what's the scoop? Why do you guys have two buildings? He was all oh, back in the 50s. The church split over Calvinism and half the church went and built a new church. And then 30 years later, they decided, ah, oh, let's all come together and rejoin and be one church again. And so they had two buildings 
and then they came back together. So now they have two buildings and, and one church. So this whole idea has split churches. So, all right, we're going to spend next week 13 minutes discussing some of this stuff. And then get to Galatians 2.20, okay? Set a time. Huh? Set a time. Set a time. All right. So I want to, uh, I, I never get to my end slide, by the way. So I'm going to, oh, what happened to my end slide? There's my end slide. Um. Oh, I missed my big finish, too, and to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Next week, the exchange, Life Galatians 2.20. Um, I will email that chart out, like the day before, like I did. I will email you by tomorrow this time. I didn't do it until Thursday. I, I'm kind of busy, but I will email the homework for you tomorrow out so you have that um, as well. Anybody don't have a printer? One person? Two, you don't have a printer? Okay, three. Okay, I will print some off and leave them at door four tomorrow as well. Okay, and I'll put uh, seven scriptures class. I just, I didn't get to printing them for some reason. I forgot to print the homework. So I'm over it. Lord, salvation is a big deal. We want to understand it properly. We want to understand that it was motivated by your love for us and what it cost. Peter says that we were bought with a price we are not our own, and that price was the precious blood of Christ. We remember that this week, that you demonstrated your love for us, died for us, and that whosoever believes will be saved. That's your simple picture of salvation. But Lord, salvation is so much, that big long list of all the things that you do to whosoever believes, You've made us new, a new creation, and we now have eternal life. Lord, help us rest in that truth this week. We pray in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Sorry I went over, guys. Stop recording.